second. I appreciate it. And then let's. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Is there a way on the host side to silence everyone? Oh, true. Okay. When like yeah, when dogs barking or whatever. Yeah. Let all participants me, or whatever. Uh. Well, let me uh show non-video and then make. Oh, you you do have co-host permission, so you should be able to see it. Let's go to your computer. And then I've got it so that, because we're going to record it, so I want to see you in the recording. So, you know, if you're over here, you'll see yourself. So the um, camera is right here, right? Yep, exactly. And then we have a clicker for your PowerPoint. Perfect, thank you. And I'm going to record it. Yeah, if you'll see. You'll see that you're here. Got it. Uh, you some coffee or water? I want to leave you straight. Um, that's true. Yes, that's back that way.
I did a couple things. I did the investment housing committee. No, 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 that. Yeah, I'll buy my you were going, weren't you going somewhere? To do something fun that day? You were going, you just went to your Well, I, I left off and I go. So, I don't know why I thought you were going to do something fun that day. Uh, I wish I, I, I was able to, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, went, I think that when I saw you, I dropped my stuff and I went over to. Uh, Another viewing for, for lunch with, uh, with uh, nice. some colleagues, but, but after that, I came back. I, I took off. Could, I mean, I don't know. Did I? No, we played play. play. yeah. I figured the time I need to drive versus the time I need to fly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it took me like five hours. How did God deal with? But then you get to the airport, an hour and a half in mass, and you get there. I know. Yeah. I I typically fly, but then you know, but that trip is a little tricky. Yes. Well, thank you for doing this today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. 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 I'm just gonna stand. I'm just gonna look at the camera. <laughs>
Okay. Could go either way. Uh, you might want to get a second opinion. All right, let's. Uh, are we uh, technologically uh, set up, right? We are all, right. all set. So I am going to spend less time talking uh, so that Oscar has more time to talk. Oscar is the chief economist for, uh, for California Association of Realtors. Deputy chief. Deputy chief. <laughs> but just for voting me, that's great. You're in. You're in. That's great. Uh, uh, I trust you all the same. Oh, it says great. There you go. Uh, we are... Uh, we, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've done this exercise every year, right? And it's super insightful and important for us to know the past, present, and future of, of where we are, right? That's exactly and what you guys take this information out into the universe. Uh, Oscar presents it in a very compelling, uh, digestible way. Uh, the, uh, the slides are available after. Absolutely, yes. Right? So you can go back, integrate the information into your... Uh, into your uh, life, no one can absorb all of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's a lot, but uh, you will hopefully this will uh, excite you to go out there and have uh, have have uh, you know confident conversations with your with your people. It's a, you know we, we feel like well I feel uh, optimistic, but I guess I'll wait to see what you. But anything else, Oscar? Any ground rules or anything you want to say before we get started? Nothing. Um, one more thing to add. I do have notes for slides. I have, I have some notes in the slide section. Those in the slide section. section. Okay. So feel free to take a look at those notes. No, not a whole lot, but you know, some of those. Okay. You know, maybe a little hard to understand just looking at the slides. So take a look at the notes as well. Sure. It, well, at least the, maybe those notes will like harken back to what you know, the, the color you add to those slides. Exactly. Right? I know, you know, I go to um, Family Reunion every year and there's a state of the market um, um, and Gary creates these incredibly <laughs> compelling narratives around every slide and I'm like, <gasps> and then I go home and I have the slide and uh, not as much, uh, you know, kind of color around the slide. So uh, that's great that there's, uh, there's some notes in there that we can refer back to. Definitely. All right, Oscar. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that I've, I have that. You got it? Good. I've been, I, I'm pretty sure that I've been here. Um, it's, it's coming back to you now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Waterfront is a, an area that, you know, I, I visit when, I mean, of course, we're not actually working in the office now. We're actually from home, but uh, it's actually very close to where our headquarters was. So, you know, here by you know, the Petit Greek is a place that we uh, yeah. frequently visited. Before. Was. Oh. What? Oh, it's closed? It's good, yeah. Oh, I did not know that. You can go Greek on Thursday. They open it up there. I'll check it out. Ready to go. Um, I, so I do have a lot of information to share. Um, Sometimes it needs a little kickstart, Oscar. Sure. I have a clicker myself, too, if, if need be. Give it a shot. Let's try it. There you go. Okay, here we go. So I do have a lot of things to, to cover. Now, in the past, I typically put all these bullet points or the highlights or whatever you call it at the very end. But I figured it's probably best to show what the projections might be. And then you can follow through, you know, with the slides that I'm going to go through. And maybe that makes a little bit more sense. So if you look at, I have two segments, you know, the economic outlook and the market outlook. If you look at the economic outlook, those are the th uh, three bullet points. What about the economy? What's going to happen to the economy? Because that's, that's going to have an effect on, of course, inflation. And by now, many of you probably know, inflation has an, infact, has an impact on interest rates. And we want to know about inflation. Maybe everyone in this room probably are somewhat familiar or maybe an expert in inflation now after two years-ish or so, three years of ish. So if you take a look at the economic outlook, you know, the, the economic growth, is actually going to be positive this year. Now it's going to be softer. It's going to be a 0.7%. I think it's going to be even higher than that based on you know, some of the results that we have seen, but we're going to keep it at 0.7% right now for the GDP growth rate. Now just as a comparison, what exactly is 0.7%? A normal economy, maybe pre-pandemic level, maybe about 3% or so. So just to get an idea, I'll show you some historical numbers in the next few slides. And then of course, Employment, unemployment, and unemployment, and the labor market. 
how is it doing in the unemployment rate and labor market? It's going to reach about 4.4%, just as a comparison as well. Last year, 2023, it was 3.7. It was actually a very good year. But prior to that, typically economists think, you know, 5% is actually pretty good, 4.5% is pretty good. So 4.4% is actually not too bad. Of course, inflation. We've experienced inflation ourselves. Probably some of you maybe recently bought, bought eggs. You probably know eggs compared to like maybe a month ago, two months ago, it's a little bit more expensive. But compared to a year ago, it's actually cheaper. And of course, gas prices. Those are things that actually could drive inflation up. Inflation is going to continue to cool in the next 12 months, but it may not get to that level that the Federal Reserve or the Central Bank wants. And that's going to have an impact on interest rate. Now, of course, it's going to have an impact on the market. How's the market doing right now? Probably a little bit better compared to last year. A little bit more activity. Now, that's because at the end of last year, we had some uh, drop in interest rates, but it started bouncing back up. If you look at the 30-year uh, fixed rate, our prediction is it's probably going to average about 6.3% after reaching 6.8% last year. That's an average of last year, 6.8. Now, 6.3% average, it may not give you a lot of um, directions right away, but I'll, I'll kind of give you some detail about exactly you know, where it will direction-wise where it's going to go. By the end of next year, I'm hope, or by the end of this year, I'm hoping that it will reach 6, maybe 5.8. I can't promise you 3%. When you say reach, <laughs> you mean like settle in around there. Right. Right. Because, you know, we've seen fluctuation, you know, yes. fluctuations that dipped into the fives in different, in different types of offerings. Right. At the beginning of this year, it was, we thought, well, it's, it's got to 6.5 or 6.2 yeah. or 6.3. And then, of course, it started bouncing back. Hopefully, you know, we'll see some trend, downward trend. Now, it's going to see some fluctuation, but hopefully we'll see some downward trend. And, of course, that's going to have an impact on sales. It's going to have an impact on price. We, you know, at the state level, we had a tough time, really tough time last year and the year before. We actually dropped uh, roughly about 22%, 23% last year in terms of sales, existing single family home. But this year, we do expect a bounce back. Already, we are already seeing in the, in the first month of this year, a little bounce back. Not great, but a positive number. So that's good. <coughs> Price-wise, the statewide median price, we are probably going to see an increase of about 6% because of, you probably already know, tight supply. We have been seeing very tight supply. And I expect the supply, I'm going to be conservative. I expect the supply or active listings to increase by between 10 to 20%. At the state level. Now it could be higher. I've been to other outreaches and people think, oh, it's gonna fly, it's going to actually surge, but I'm just gonna be conservative and say, you know, roughly about 20%. So let's talk in a little bit more detail about the economic outlook. I gave you those numbers. How are we gonna reach there? Well, first let's take a look at some historical number. Look at the slide right here, the slide with the bars. It shows you the uh, quarterly numbers on a quarterly basis. We are actually seeing at the beginning of last year, it was somewhat decent, still not robust. First half of the year, we were growing at around 2% or so. These two bars right here. And then the third and the fourth quarter, we actually did a little bit better. Third quarter, we actually increased close to 5%. And then the last quarter of 2023, a 3.3%. Now, how do we actually get you know, a 3.3% at the end of last year? Look at some of these numbers based on MasterCard spending plus at the survey. It shows you, well, we all spent quite a bit of money at the end of last year between November <coughs> and December. We splurged a little bit. We went out to eat. Look at the restaurants. It actually increased by about 8%. Now, I have to be, uh, be honest about these numbers. These numbers do not take into account inflation, which means you know, when prices while well, prices went up at the end of last year compared to the year before, of course, it's going to show an increase in um, spending. Now, that's the end of last year. But the third quarter, as I mentioned, was very strong. What happened in the third quarter? Well, you know, there were some concerts, right? There were some, so there were some concerts, uh, Taylor Swift, as well as Beyonce, some concerts that went on. And to, uh, to the extent that they, they actually created some terms, for you know the economic impact 
Look at the number, uh, look at the term right there, swiftonomics, new term. There's something called fund inflation. That's in my note. You can take a look at it. You can Google and see what fund inflation really means. They're spending a little bit more money on, people are spending more money on um, life event to life experience. Now, they, it does have an impact on um, the, the economy, and that's why it went up by 4.9%. I mean, I'm not saying that that's the whole reason for it. There are other reasons for it as well. But, of course, we spend, and sometime, we might have actually put our uh, spending on our credit cards. We may not put our credit, uh, on credit cards, but we may actually spend and use you know, some of the new financing options, buy now and pay later. And now interest rates, of course, we usually focus interest rates on how much we have to actually have to pay for our mortgage and stuff like that. But of course, our credit cards also have increased interest rate, also affect our credit card payments. So in the last month of this year, of last year, December, it shows that things are actually, if you look at this line right underneath that uh, divider right there, it shows that on a year over year basis, we actually increased 5.3% for retail sales activity, consumer spending. If you look at it from that standpoint, that's very good. Actually, that's highest in uh, throughout the last 12 months, uh, unless we go back to February 2023. 22 was pretty rough. Yes. The end of 22 was pretty rough. Yes. Uh, it was still a positive number, though, it back was. then. Yeah. Now, but so you look at these numbers, you might think, you, you might think well, that's actually pretty good in December. But remember what I said, and if you look at the uh, this is this last number right here, the real retail sales number, that's accounted for inflation. That's taking into account our inflation. But take a look at what happened in January. The number seems to be a little bit soft. You, we are seeing a 0.6% year over year only, a 0.5% when you take into account inflation when you when it compares to last year. What happened? Well, of course, you rack up all those bills, those bills come due, what do you have to do? You have to cut back on spending. Cuts back on spending, plus of course, February, March, we probably will start working on our taxes. Those are going to actually lead to some softer economic uh, activity. So we expect the first quarter to be a little softer. Now, there are more than just, you know, how much people spend, some of these other indicators, how many jobs we have out there probably is an indication of whether the economy is doing well or not. If you look at the bar chart right there, the monthly job creation in US, we are seeing, if you look at this number, these bars in October, we thought, okay, well, the, 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 the job creations actually has been pretty good, pretty solid. We have been experiencing over 200,000 even 300,000 or so. Now the pre-pandemic level, just as a uh, comparison, is roughly about 200,000. And so in October, we dipped to about 180. We thought, okay, the market is soft. It's getting a little soft now. Things are actually not going to be overheated. But what happened in the next three months? It started rising again. In fact, the expectation, if the numbers actually exceeded expectation. In, in January, people expected, oh, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I don't want to block out all those lights. Now, and thank you very much. Now, if you look at the first month of the year, the expectation from economists was 185. It came in at 100, 350. So the job market actually expended. It continued to rise. It has some impact, though. I'll talk about that in a minute. The other part of the job creation uh, is uh, the job report is how much wages actually have been increasing. The reason why that is important is, of course, when wages increase, those uh, costs that factors into employers' costs and that will probably lead to increase in prices that could lead to inflation. This number, the hourly earning, actually increased by 4.5. And um, it's actually a bounce back. It has been actually slowing down to 4.1 and then it bounced back to 4.4. So because of the strong report in, in January, there were some concerns. And you probably notice interest rates are rising, right? That's because a strong report of uh, so, uh, the solid report in labor market, that may suggest that inflation could actually start rising again. Let's take a look at what exactly happened with inflation then. 
look at inflation. Inflation, remember at one point we were up what, 9%? If you look at this number right here, that's about 9%. At one point, you know, we were at 9%. Now, of course, some of you probably experienced, some experienced the uh, inflation situation back in 1980s or 1990s. We had inflation flaring up with interest rate. Probably some of you remember if the interest rate was at what? 15? Oh, 10 to 13. It's right. Not when I bought my first house. Yeah. In the 80s. In the 80s. And then 1920. Yeah. So it was way back up. But of course, we are so accustomed to seeing three or 4%. Now the the uh, the um, infl the interest rate at that level was partly because of inflation, but fortunately inflation actually came down. It got, came all the way down to three point one. It has been bouncing back and forth, and then it actually kind of stabilizing at three point one percent. Now three point one percent is not bad, but of course everything is in comparison to the expectation. What do you think the expectation was last month for uh, inflation? Just a wild guess. Two seven. Close. It was two two point nine. So of course, when you have expectation uh, uh, below what the actual number was, and it came in a little higher, people uh, kind of freaked out a little bit, and that's the reason why we started seeing some increase in right and rates. And these are some of the items. You probably already experienced it. Vehicle insurance, auto insurance has increased by twenty percent. Um, there are there are some stuff that actually dropped. You know, fares cereal, major appliances, those are things that drop, but there are things that actually increase. Um, one of the things that talked about all the time in the news is shelter costs, rent costs. I know, and, and um, just so you know, I'm, give, I'm going to give you sort of like a, a heads up. At the very end of the presentation, I also included um, a, an outlook for uh, rental market, because I know you guys put, you do some leases as well. So if you're interested in a presentation that I actually did last week on investment housing committee for the, for the housing investment housing committee on rental housing market, let me know. I have my email at, at the very end. Send me an email. I can send you that slide deck as well. And I'm so sorry, all these numbers are for California or national? These are national numbers. Mm -hmm. And I will have some California numbers, not necessarily for inflation, but for the housing market in a minute. So if you look at all these numbers, yes, inflation has been flaring up. Shelter costs actually is one thing that actually continue to rise. Um, and of course, all of us wondered, you know, where is inflation going? Are we going to go, why are you going back to the, the level that we were at uh, before? The level that the Federal Reserve want us to get back to was 2.5%, it's between two and two and a half percent. And if you look at UCLA's number, these are UCLA, UCLA's numbers. UCLA put out something on a quarterly basis. And the numbers in red, those are projections. By the end of 2025, based on UCLA's projections, we are only going to get to 2.7%. Now, in, uh, towards the end, I'll tell you what the 2.7 or 2.6% inflation means for interest rates. Where would that actually land if that we actually end up at 2.5, 2.6? But the other part of it, which is encouraging, is consumers' expectation. Consumers' expectation has come back, has, has, has come down from about 7% to 3%. So that means consumers expect 12 months from now, prices are going to increase from today by about 3%, which is still higher than 2.5%, but you know, it's getting better, getting better. And their confidence is building up because now, remember what I showed you earlier about wage growth? Wages were growing at around 4.1%, 4.1, 4 4.2%, I think it was 4.5. Um, but that number is definitely higher than the inflation number. So when they're making a little bit more, when the wages are growing a little bit more, but uh, the price is actually not growing as fast, they feel a little bit better, consumer confidence actually increased for the third time in a row. It's actually the highest maybe since May 2022. So that's great. And that's one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve now believe that you know, they're not going into, we're not going to a recession. Remember last year we talked about recessions. We hear, we, we've been hearing you know, that new in the news, oh, we're gonna go into recessions. We're gonna have a, uh, we're gonna have a little dip this year, maybe for first and second quarter. Well, that's most likely going to be the oddest less likely now. And if you look at business leaders, they actually think that they actually their confidence also has have been increasing. 
In fact, it actually increased or surpassed the 50 basis point. That 50 line means more people believe that we are actually going to have uh, uh, the, the economy is going to continue to grow rather than decline. And, but there are, so they do believe that there are some opportunities out there. The survey done, this was again done at a national level. These are some of the opportunity, quote unquote, opportunity that they believe will benefit the bus their businesses. Of course, reduce inflation is number one, Fed interest rate cuts, faster productivity. Those are some of the things that you know, a lot of us believe that will help the economy as well as their businesses. What about challenges? What are some of the challenges that you think might actually hurt our businesses? I have, the, I have it in the next slide. Politics, uh, election year. Uh, yeah. you, you're right on. You might have uh, took a peek of my... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have it in two separate categories, US challenges as well as global. So Joey, you got you know the top two. Of course, this is an election year and I have a, a couple of slides at the very end to show you what some of the impact could possibly be. Pol uh, political uncertainty, of course, number one and the spread of existing wars. Geopolitical tension is definitely you know, a concern for many people. Um, and of course, deglobalization and the increase in regulations. You can take a look at these. And these are based on, again, all the business leaders. Well, not all the business leaders, maybe about a couple hundred business leaders. Um, so these are some of the concerns, things that actually could change. Now, I mentioned earlier, um, people don't talk about recessions anymore or as much. A few quarters ago, during earning calls, uh, all those you know, earning calls about, you know, that you get at the end of the or one o'clock, two o'clock, you get a lot of earning calls and people talk about recessions, but the number of calls that actually talk about recessions actually has dramatically come, has come down dramatically. So people feeling a little bit more confident. This, these are the numbers that I showed you earlier, the 0.7% increase in GDP, unemployment at 4.4%. Those are the same numbers that I showed you earlier at the very beginning. And of course the CPI, the average for 2020, Four, we predicted it to be a 2.6. So I'll tell you uh, a little later what exactly is the 2.6% mean for 30 year fixed rate. And here's the California number. We are going to see some growth in terms of jobs, in terms of unemployment. It is going to actually be a little bit up from the year before. Not terrible, but still up. Population wise, it actually will stay flat for now. I think it dropped for a couple years for our population, but it actually started, you know, flattening out a little bit this year. And we'll see how it goes, you know, in the next couple months or so. Let's talk about the market. We only have one month of data. You might have seen some of the releases that we uh, sent out or published last week. We uh, sent out, we published something last on Friday, I believe, um, on the January number. I know we may not have the latest up-to-date February's number, but you can actually take a look at, if you go to the CR website, we have a weekly market minute. We do that every Monday. We release for something on Monday. It's in the industry and it's in our market data section. Um, take a look at the market minutes. We actually talk about the economy and as well as the market um, every Monday. Now let's look at the January's number. These are some numbers that we released. I said earlier, we're seeing a little bit more activity and I didn't lie. January closed sales actually increased by about 6%, close to 6%. Now that's because of more activities at the end of last year, maybe because of interest rate coming down. Um, prices continue to increase by about 5%, even though compared to a month ago, it actually dipped, but that's because of seasonality. Um, look at unsold inventory index and months of supply remain very tight at 3.2 months. Now this is California number, these are California numbers. I have some local statistics in a few minutes. And in terms of days on market, the uh, property center market for about 32 days in general for, for this is a state number, as I mentioned, it could be actually uh, shorter for some areas. At different price point though, we have different trends. These are the breakdown based on the different price point from zero to two, uh, 300 all the way to 2 million. And you can see we have some positive number actually towards the end. 
meaning the higher end properties, higher price properties are actually doing a little bit better. Now I'm generalizing and say higher end property. Right, because in our market, a $2 million property is close to the average sale price. Right, right. Right, right for a single family home. And you can also think of it this way, because this is a state number. When I say high end or higher price properties, Metropolitan areas like LA could have higher prices. That also means you know, you're know you seeing more activities in higher price areas like LA, probably in the Bay Area as well. Uh, and of course, we're seeing some activities in these higher price points, which means you know we're, and, and you probably know in Orange County, they actually have scumped quite a bit of activity in terms of sales. The prices actually have been growing a little bit. And it has a lot to do with, of course, interest rate. We show you, I, I talked about interest rate a lot earlier. Take a look, what, look at what happened. I tracked two sets of data, Freddie Mac's number, as well as the mortgage new estate, the blue line. You can see towards the end of the uh, last year, interest rate came down because we saw softer inflation numbers. That's great. But what happened in the last few weeks? We have stronger, the job reports that I show you, that's stronger, that inflation report that I show you exceeded expectation. And that's why, you know, we start seeing some increase in rates. Is that just conforming loans? Is that just conforming lending or is that all? That's all, sales? that's all 30 years. Now, of course, it's based on probably a sample, not every single transaction, but based on a sample. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is a chart that shows you, now if someone were to buy a home, a median price home, a price a home right in the middle, price right in the middle, if they put 20% down payment, how mortgage payment would change for every 50 basis point increase. Roughly, let's say from 6% to 6.5%, the mortgage payment would jump about 200 bucks. So at 200 bucks. So that's why, you know, when we had three and a half percent back then versus now six and a half percent, you know, we're seeing on a monthly basis, mortgage payment actually increased quite a bit for buyers. And that's a lot of reasons why buyers are having a little tough time. Now we actually did a survey back in, in the second quarter. You might have actually participated in the survey yourself. If you did, thank you very much for putting those in because that's important. We wanted to know, you know, to buyers, you know, what they're paying, how much they're paying in terms of down payment, their mortgage payment, and of course, their household income. You can see the difference between 2021, 2022, and 2023. Look at the mortgage payment increase. It jumped from 2000 all the way to 3420 for the exact same priced home. And their down payment also increased by about 50000 and of course, their household income also increased by about, uh, about 10,000. So it does have an impact on buyers. And many of the buyers are first time buyers, right? In fact, about 30, let me skip this one. Let me show you this first. 36% of all buyers in 2023 were first time buyers. 36%. So you can imagine many of those first time buyers they have, they don't, they may not necessarily have the equity. And what happened? They have to borrow from their friends, family. About 16% of all buyers borrowed from their family or friends. But look at first time buyers 34% of them borrowed from their parents. So it makes it a little tough. Um, now, in addition to first time buyers, we also have second home buyers. We also have investors' buyers. Those buyers actually increase their share. Uh, partly because they have a little bit more income. So in 2023 or 2024, we may actually see this uh, type of buyers actually remaining uh, at a decent share of 7%, 8% or so. Now, investor buyers though, those who actually purchase a property and rent it out may actually come down a little bit. Part of the reason why that is the case is, you know, rent, uh, rent growth has, well, restrictions have, has uh, there are restrictions, but rent growth actually has come down as well. Um, the prices actually have go have gone up for you know overall prices, so it, it has come down a little bit. Uh, if you look at those, the share of those buyers, those investors buyers who flip versus rent, 
the share in 2023 actually has increased or has decreased for those rental, rental buyers or rental investors. Um, that's because the rental market fluctuated a little bit in 2023. Now, I talked a little bit about the demand side. What about the supply side? Because mortgage interest rate increasing or at a high level definitely affected the supply side as well. And that's why we were seeing very tight supply from many of the, uh, many of the markets. Take a look at what happened. This is again, based on a survey. Now, back then, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people used to stay actually in their home for maybe what, seven years or so, eight years or so. But now take a look at this trend. These, this is a trend that shows you the years of numbers of holding on to a property before selling. People are actually are, are staying in their home for a little longer now, 12 years. And the reason why that is the case, because they, lock in their, they locked in their rates three, four years ago because of capital gain taxes and things like that. Now, if you don't believe the survey results, let's look at, well, let me, let me skip this for now. Actually, no, let me don't skip this because um, I want to emphasize the point. The reason why people are holding on to their property if they actually have cash, they want to buy a property or what they want to, they don't need to refinance, that's great. You know, they can just, you know, use their cash and buy another property. But many of the sellers themselves are buyers. They need to sell their property and then they use the proceeds and buy another property and then finance with whatever money they have, well, with, that, with uh, whatever rate they have at the time. In fact, about 50%, close to 50% actually plan to buy another home. So because they're also buyers, they care about interest rates. And here's another survey of results that shows you one of the top reasons why homeowners are holding on to their property. Mortgage rates on another home would be too high. That's their number one reason. Now there are other reasons as well. Feel free to take a look at those. Um, so buyers or sellers definitely has been uh, affected by interest rates. Now, if you don't believe those survey results, take a look at this chart. This is a chart that shows you a breakdown of the, all the outstanding mortgages in California. And it's broken out into the mortgage rate sector. So back in 2013, first quarter, if you look at the, the segment at the top, the segment on top reflects or tells you the percent of mortgages that has 6% or higher. Back then we had 27% of mortgages with 6% or higher. Fast forward to 10 years later, it was only 7.1%. And that's because a lot of people lock in at you know, a very, very low rate, 3%, 4%. And that's why at the current level, if at 6.5%, a lot of people do not you know, put their house up in the market and buy another home because they don't want to give up their, their low rates. Now, when, as things start getting better, hopefully we will see a little bit more supply. And we actually started seeing a little bit more supply at the beginning of this year. When we look at new active list, listing, newly added listings to the, to the market, that number, even though it's still small, if you look at this number compared to a year ago number, it is, it is, an, it is an increase at the state level. In fact, it's actually the first increase maybe in 19 months. We had a 14.2% increase in the supply. So lower rates did increase, uh, did help you know, increase the supply a little bit. But of course, we did have some fluctuation in, in, in rates recently. Now let's look at price. This is a statewide number. Again, I'll show you some local statistics very shortly. If you look at the statewide number, it's showing a 5% increase, which is what I showed you earlier. And it probably will continue to increase because of what happened in supply. Now, let's take a look at different price points. I think I show you, I think I show you a different price point, how sales behave, right? But I should also show you how prices behave. At the top end, the top 80th to 20, 100 percentile, that probably means, you know, $1.5 million and up homes. They actually are increasing, at least in, in, in January, they were increasing at four, around 4%. So at the top end, it seems to be increasing a little faster. Again, uh, it could be because of the geographic locations as well. Let's take a look at some regional numbers. 
Now, I may not have all the local statistics. I'm going to show you some regional, meaning uh, Southern California and then LA, um, or like some county. And then I have some city specific level data. I only have two or three right now, but on the CRL website, I'll show you exactly where, or I can tell you exactly where to get those when we get to that point. So Southern California makes up about 55% of all sales in California. And this is not a surprise that we're it's increasing in the same direction. Sales increased by 2.2% and price actually increased by about 7%, similar to the state level. Now, here are some county level statistics. I only have the first month compared to this first month of last year, but take a look at these numbers. These are the numbers in the first month. Now we're seeing increase in Southern California, LA, River, um, San Bernardino, and Ventura. They're increasing in terms of sales, but Orange County dipped a little bit, uh, Riverside dipped a little bit, and San Diego was pretty flat. So in the first month, of, these are closed sales. Again, demand, uh, pending sales, I don't have pending sales numbers here, but if you look at that, statewide number, it actually showed an increase in pending as well. But of course, I think because of the fluctuation in interest rates in the last couple of weeks or so, we might actually have some pullback. So we'll see how that goes. So that's sales number, that's raw sales number. If you look at price, price increased, if you look at the year over year, it increased modestly in most counties, except for maybe San Diego and Orange County, they actually have been growing a little faster. Now, there is a, a word of caution for some of the uh, median price. Median price, the definition of median price is the price right in the middle, right? If we have more sales in the higher end, that typically pulls the median up, regardless of whether individual home actually increase in price. So we did have a shift in the mix of sales towards the higher end in the last couple of years. So it might actually pull the median price up a little bit. But in general, um, I would say, and this is very general, I would say maybe about 70% of the price increase is due to um, actual price increase. The other 30% could, could be due to mix of sales change. Um, and uh, active listings. This is another part that you want to take a look at. And this, is, this seems encouraging. If you look at county level, we are seeing at least for the month of January, some increase in active listings which is great because we need you know, more supply in order to get more sales. So in the next three slides, I think I have Beverly Hills, I have LA and I have Culver City. Um, you can find many other cities on our CR website. Just go to Industry 360, go to market data and look for housing market overview. And at the end of my presentation, I have my email. So if you couldn't find it, let me know. So this is a one pager. This is something that you can actually download a single one pager, and then you can share with your client, send it out as well. Um, it's right now it's in slide format, but you can also get um, a different format like Instagram format, or some other format for social media. So if you look at what I have here is first, I have the year to date for December, which, which means for the year as a whole for 2023 first to give you some history and then give you some present, which is just January, 2024 number. Now, if you look at the year as a whole for Beverly Hills, um, safe to say, of course, last year was a tough year. We actually dropped 37% in sales last year. Price in general actually dipped about 6% in Beverly Hills. Active listing actually inched up uh, for the year as a whole um, for active list. Now this is, let me, let me rephrase this. This is a monthly average, I should say. This is not the raw number uh, accounting for the whole year. So it's all those 20 to $60 million houses that are not moving on the market. Yeah. That's right. Well, you, you, know, you definitely know more than I do. And of course, um, those are things that actually have been staying on the market for a yeah. little longer. Um, so it, it, it makes sense that you know, the active listings are up and the, uh, the actual sales are low, right? Because they're just, you know, there's a ton of stuff that's not selling. Right, well, when you have, typically when you don't have enough, if you have lower sales, you probably see a little bit more active listings. Un 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 unless the reason is you don't have supply to sell. And that's why sales drop. Now in Beverly Hills, that may not necessarily be the case. This is the city of Beverly Hills. City of Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills Post Office, correct? City of Beverly Hills. Sure. Now, Culver City. Culver City is another um, is another city. 
that I showed, total number of home sales drop, median price drop, and active listings, average active listings actually increased 23.7%. As Joey said, you know, it could possibly be some, you know, uh, listings being left on market because of not having enough sales, not having enough demand, or, or maybe at the end of last year, we have a, a bit more, um, a bit more active listings towards the end of last year. 100% of the listings that are currently active have had to lower the price. Is that what that means? This, the sales to list price ratio? This one? Sold at sold. Right, sold at, so if it's- it, a percent of active listings have reduced price. Oh, this one? Oh, I see. I'm looking at the difference. Right. So I was looking at that too. <laughs> oh, I saw that too and I was like, that's a lot. So a lot of that's all so, like for over I get it. Got it. That's right. So, Thank you. So okay. we do have typically active uh, percent of active listings with reduced price. When the market was really hot, it shouldn't be this high. Okay. But of course, last year, because of interest rate and the year before, we started seeing high interest rate. The numbers started getting a little bit higher. And here's LA. Here we go. Here's LA. Um, drop in sales. Slight drop in price, 1.3%. Now, remember what I said, you know, this is a, the median price here reflect the entire year. First half of last year was actually tough. Second half of last year, it's actually getting a little bit better, but sales actually dipped a little bit more. And so we still, we're still seeing a 1.3% decline because of that reason. This year, it probably will be a, a better number, probably a five or 6% increase. Um, it's only the beginning of the year, but I believe that's probably going to be the case. Now, uh, like I said, the numbers that I show you, those are 2023 numbers. This is the, these are the latest, the next three slides are the latest from January. You can see we're seeing some improvement, but of course, obviously it didn't jump 48%, probably because we have some higher price properties being sold that changed and makes up sales a little bit. We only, well, of course, uh, the number of observations is only 15. That's why you know uh, there's a, some fluctuation there. There was a slight increase in active listings uh, compared to last January or so. Uh, I guess sales to list price ratio did drop a little bit, you know, for those 15 sales. Um, Culver City, Culver City um, number of sales is not huge, um, still only seven, but compared to last year, it's slightly increased. Of course, this again has something to do with probably selling a little bit higher price and the sales to list price ratio actually inched up a little bit. And then LA. LA, uh, again, increase in sales, slight increase in price, uh, slight drop in active listing. Like I said, it's very, very beginning of the year. So it's really hard to say. Uh, but let's take a look at, so we got a chance to just look at the historical numbers, you know, what happened just last month. But of course, you want to know what's going to happen. So let's take a look in the next 15 minutes or so. Let's try to speculate. Let's see if the crystal ball works. <laughs> um, first, when you want to find out how things are panning, panning out, you want to know what buyers and sellers are thinking. Right? You want to know their sentiment. This is a national number again, uh, but every month there is uh, Fannie Mae does a home purchase sentiment survey and they ask whether the people believe it's a good time to buy or a good time to, a bad time to buy. Take a look at this blue line right here. It actually was all the way up to 52% because when, at that time interest rate was very, very low, has dropped. And it bottomed out at 14%. Now, current level at 17% is not great, but the direction is actually encouraging because it looks like more people believe that it might be a good time to buy, increasing from 14 to 17%. It's minimal, but it's a start. Hopefully it will continue to go up. And one of the biggest reasons for why people think it's a good time to buy, what do you think consumers think about interest rates? When I ask about interest rates, again, look at this blue line right here. They believe interest rates are going to go down. It was two, three months ago, it was 22% believe it's gonna go down. Now it jumped to 36%. So many believe that things are going to go down in terms of interest rates. Are interest rates going to go down? 
Do you believe interest rates are going to go down? Yes. Yes. Well, if you buy into what I just said earlier, inflation is going to come down. And if you believe what the central bank or the Federal Reserve um, suggested, then yes. Take a look at this chart. I know it's a lot of dots right here. And that's why they call it dot plot. This is a chart. These are two charts that every other meeting, the Federal Reserve, the central bank released these numbers. Let me make it, try to make it simple. These are basically the votes. The federal officials, there are 18 of them. They put in their vote, they cast their vote. They, they will tell you, well, each meeting, they'll put in a vote and say, hey, what do I think the year end number is going to be for what they call the Fed funds rate, the key policy rate. At the end of 2023, these are actual numbers. Or well, actually right now, the Fed funds rate it is between the target, it is between 525 to 550. To make some sense out of it, if you add 200 basis point to it, that's your 30 year fixed rate. I'm making it very simple, probably 180 basis point, but I'm making it very simple. 525 to 550, that was their expectation. If you take the average, that's their expectation, that's their actual number at the end of last year. Now, what do they think the 2024 number is going to be at the end of the year? That's how you try to figure out whether they believe it's going to be an interest rate cut. If all of them believe the year end of 2024, that target range is going to be below this number, that means they believe there will be a rate cut. The average, as of December, they made their vote, they, they casted their vote, and here are the numbers. This is right in the middle. If you look at the trend, it looks like they believe by the end of this year, they will cut rate by about 75 basis point. And more importantly, it looks like that trend is gonna to continue to go down. That means 2025, 2026, they believe that they'll cut rate a little bit more. Of course, this was done in December. Now we have a few more reports that came out between then and now. And I think that uh, cut is going to be a little bit smaller, at least as of now. It may not be 75 basis point, it may be 50 basis point. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing some bounce back in interest rates right now. Yeah. I think people got excited at the beginning of the year. They thought they were gonna reduce and then the numbers came back too good and then they decided not to reduce. And, and if you believe Wall Street, of course, sometimes they're a little over excited. Mm -hmm. Some actually believe that it's gonna cut 150 basis point. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I never believe that is the case. Um, but I think they lowered their expectation a little bit. Maybe between your uh, your conservative estimate and their uh, overzealous estimate, we'll wind up somewhere in the middle between the two. Probably, right. probably. Yeah. Now, yes. right now, if you if you don't want just you know what happened at the end of the year, there's actually a tool. You can go to CME Group, type in CME Group on a daily basis. They actually put out the odds of rate cut for the next meeting and the meeting after that. <laughs> now, and that's the reason why I actually give you two projections because they change every single, they could change every single day. So let's take a look at the March number or what they expect, or, or I'm sorry, let's take a look at the first, the projection for the March meeting, which is the next meeting. Now, if you look at the number that I collected yesterday, after all those inflation report, take a look at the number, what they expect the March number is going to be. Remember, this is the target range right now. That means 90, 91%, 92% chance that they will actually stay, they are going to stay at this level, which means no rate cut. And this is a survey from, from the Fed. No. Is this the, who's who's, uh, this is based on a, a company called CME Group, which is a finance company. Gotcha. So they collect information from maybe based on from macroeconomic numbers, but also maybe from um, opinions from other analysts. So this suggests that 92% chance that it is going to stay at that level, which means no rate card. Now, if you rewind, uh, uh, a month ago, before all those reports, they were more optimistic. 
76 percent, 76, 77 percent, probably that it was going to go down from this level to this level. So it was pre previously thought 25, 25 basis point cut in the first meeting, but that's no longer the case. What about the meeting after that, which is the May 1st meeting? Maybe we are a little bit more hopeful for rate cut then. Take a look. Slightly a little bit more, but not a whole lot. 66, 65% believe that it's going to stay at that level, that 525, 550. But the chance of having a 25 basis point rate cut, 33%. Now, like I said, it could change next week when we have actually you know, an encouraging report, sure. but it's really hard to say for sure. So if you that make it crazy. <laughs> It's something to take a look at if you want uh, to try to get a sense. Um, I, of course, would not believe it completely. Uh, go back, let's go back to what I said earlier. UCLA, which should be a little more credible, but of course they missed their mark probably uh, uh, from time to time. But they believe inflation is going to get back to about 2.7% towards the end of 2025 or 2020, 2025. I, I believe that is believable. I believe that that's actually could go down to two and a half percent by the end of 2025. It depends on the situation. This is a chart that I mentioned earlier. If, if we actually get to 2.6%, 2.7%, realistically, what is interest rates going to be? What level of interest rates can we expect? We did have some errors, uh, some um, time frame that we actually had CPI, which is the inflation number, at 2.6 or 2.6. 7% or 2.5% is yourself. Back in 1994, 2004, and 2018. Let me give you an idea. Back then, with a 2.6% interest rate, we had a 30 year fixed rate of 8.4% or 8.35. In 2004, 30 year fixed rate, when we had inflation at 2.6 or 2.7, 30 year fixed rate was close to 6% at 5.84. And of course, Four, a few years ago, six years ago, when we had 2.4%, 30-year fixed rate was at 4.5. Now, if I have to guess what interest rate is going to actually end up at a 2.6 or 2.7% when inflation was at 2.6, 2.7, I would say we probably will have a 30-year fixed rate close to 5.5 to 5.75. That's my speculation. So if your client asks you, are we going to get back to 3%? Probably not. Probably not. I mean, I, I have to believe that the 3% is a wise, once in a lifetime thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are some hope, there are some hope, some, some encouraging signs though, that things are actually going to get a little bit better. If you look at how, um, how buyers react about a year ago or back in April of last year, 85%, when they look at those interest rates, when they look at the market, 85% said, oh, I'm gonna hold off. I'm not gonna buy right now. I'm gonna wait till prices come down or interest rate come down. But then of course, the patients probably wane a little bit. Remember, many buyers, most of the buyers probably are buying because of life-changing events. They're getting married, they're expanding their households. They can only wait so long. Uh, fast forward to October, six months later, 62% said the same thing. They'll wait until interest rate goes down. Even still a big number, but that number has dropped. So, I think with interest rates actually dipping down a little bit in the last couple of months, and then of course bouncing back a little bit, you actually could see more people were actually coming back to the market. Uh, if they find their home that they, they, they want to buy, if rates is right, then it's probably going to come down. They probably will start coming back in. Now, this is the pending sales number, open escrow number. It shows that we actually had a positive number on a year-over-year -year basis compared to last year. So that's another encouraging sign that things are actually hopefully moving in the right directions. But of course, these numbers got re recorded before the latest increase in rates. Um, and again, January's number, list price versus sales price. List price, the blue line, typically shows you um, as a leading indicator to what the sold price is. It looks like it's still positive, maybe only three or 4% but it's still positive. So that means close price is probably going to be an up compared to um, last year. And of course, supply side. On a supply side, we wanna know whether sellers are feeling more 
confident in selling a home, opening their house up on the market, look at the blue line again. Good time to, to sell. It did dip to about 57% back in November and December, and it started rising. So national number again? National number, yes. So we're seeing some hope, but let's wait and see you know, in the next couple of months. I show you this graph before. The reason why people are holding off is because of high interest rates, but it goes the other way too. If interest rates started coming down, that means we are probably going to see a little bit more supply. So here's the outlook for the California uh, home sales for single family. As I mentioned, a 27% increase. I have to be honest, that number is probably a little too big for this year. I would say probably about 22%. We might actually make some adjustment later on, but maybe not right away. Um, we have to wait and see how mortgage rates. Um, that's, that's a value change of 27% or a, a sales? That's sales. 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 Oh, not sales volume. It's all year over year or? Year over year, yes. Year. But of course, if you look at this number, the 327.1, it's still below 2022. It's still below 2021. The, the norm is probably about three, 400. Um, so we still have a long way to go. Um, and price is going to stay, uh, stay at 6%. Now, the, I'm, I'm, some of you probably experienced what happened in 2006, or 2007, 2008, 2009. Back then, we all, not only did we have significant drop in sales, but price dropped like 50%. The fact that it didn't drop and it's actually increased suggests to me that it's a supply issue. Um, people are more cautious. Uh, people are actually putting a little bit more money in their house when they buy, when they purchase. So this actually might insert a little bit of confidence about the market. They're just waiting for rates to come down to make it a little bit more affordable. This is the slide that I show you. I'm just gonna give you a, a, the outlook, but if you look, if you need, the entire presentation on the uh, rental housing market outlook. I'm glad to share that with you. Just send me an email. This shows you the rent growth as well as the vacancy rate increased in 2024 and 2025 for Southern California and Northern California. Um, the rental market actually, it was rent, uh, average rent was growing very fast in 2022, started slowing down in 2023 a little bit. And we do believe that certain markets are actually ex actually experienced some drop in rent growth in 2023, at least uh, uh, in general. But we're going to see some improvement in 2025 and 2024, 24 and 2025. And the reason why that is the case is because there will be less supply coming on to the market. Well, there will still be supply coming onto the market in multifamily in 2024, but that is going to slow down a little bit. Um, the dramatic slow down probably will be 2025. So you probably will see a little bit more rent growth in 2024, 2025. Vacancy rate though, is probably going to continue to inch up in both years. Now- Why is there less supply projected? So a couple of things, it, dep it depends on the developer's sentiment. Dep developers also have to be concerned about interest rates. So cost of developing is one thing, but the other part of it is they realize, oh, rent is not actually growing as fast and there's a lot of supply coming on board. Let me pull back a little bit. So those are two reasons, drop in rent growth as well as cost of uh, borrowing. Um, and of course, you probably already know, and I don't have it included here. Actually, I do have a slide included here. There are some concerns about commercial real estate, obviously. Um, there's quite a bit of concern in real, commercial real estate. I do have it in the next few slides, actually one slide. And that commercial real estate actually could be um, the market risk. But first, you already know this. Insurance is a market risk. Insurance is a wild card. We did a survey last year. 17% um, of the, we, did, we, we sent out a survey to our members, to realtors. We asked whether the buyers actually encountered any difficulty. 17% had difficulty buying insurance. And if you look at different areas, the rural areas, 32%. This is California. This is California, yes. This is California. Um, and we actually divided up to you know downtown and the city, what the uh, risk are and things like that. Um, so it's it's you know you can see that Wild there are definitely floods, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Mudslide. Yeah. Um, very, very tough. But of course, 
Um, also because some uh, insurance companies pull out of California. Uh, so it's going to be ongoing issues. And the specific reason, premium being too expensive and insurance being denied. B big majority of the reasons. Um, and the number of transactions that are actually being uh, affected fell out of escrow, 7% because, because of insurance. Because of insurance. Yes. Yes. So it's definitely a market risk and it's going to be ongoing, uh, unfortunately. Um, of course, there are some of the risks. Government shutdown. We had a concern about government shutdown uh, about, a month, about a few weeks ago. Um, they came down with a negotiation, but the negotiation is to kick it down the road. It's going to start showing. It will come up again in March. I don't think it's going to happen, but if it happened, uh, back in 2013, it actually had a shutdown. 40% of America American cut their consumer spending. So it's going to have an impact on the, on the economy if that happens. And of course, needless to say, whenever that happens, the credit rating agencies take notes. And that's one of the reasons why we actually had a little bit of a, a dip in rating, maybe a year or two years ago, I don't remember. That actually has an impact on interest rate. So um, that does have a, a, negative. Negative, a negative impact, negative, negative impact. impact. But you know, if everybody uh, cut their spending forty percent, wouldn't that uh, help the inflation numbers? Uh, that is going to yes. That is going to lead to a softer economy. Yeah. That is going to lead to a the the uh, central bank, central bank probably would jump in and try to cut rate. Yeah. Yes, that's true. But it could be at a cost. Double edged sword. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, of course, forty percent cutting consumer spending doesn't necessarily the whole year. It may be just you know a couple of weeks. Yeah. A few weeks or so, depending on how long. Now, this is a slide on CRE mortgages. Um, first, there was a study or survey that went out to people in the lending industry. They asked, CRE borrowing, is that going to be a problem? Are you concerned? Um, in, the, in the lending industry, they said in the first quarter of 2024, 90% of the respondents said it's not going to be, it's going to be, be very unsettled. And so very unsettled or somewhat unsettled, 90% believe that in the first quarter, we will have some fluctuation in the CRE market. But things are actually going to get CRE mortgages, mortgages, I should say. And things are actually going to get a little bit better as we move uh, towards 2025. But this is a year, and I don't have a slide that shows you the specific mortgages. I think, I'm just going to base a memory. Um, I believe... As far as multifamily mortgages are concerned, there will be between now and 2027, there will be roughly about one trillion at the national level, one trillion mortgages that needs to be refinanced. That means every year we're talking about 160 billion. So you're talking about um, interest only that are coming to maturity? Loans coming, are coming to, to maturity, maturity yes. It, it's to refinance most of them? Right. Now, 160 billion, that's a, a big number. Just to give you a sense, you lend it over the whole country, though. We, that's true. But 160 billion, the last time we actually had that many, well, actually, the highest that we had last time um, in terms of mortgage uh, that needs to be matured was in 2019, I believe. And the number was 75 billion. Seven, 10 year. Right now, you know, we're, if we actually, if we actually, in the next few years, if we actually spread it out, each year we'll have 160. So that number is already higher than you know what needs to be mature. Now, look at that office sector. Oh, right, <laughs> now office sector, you know. This was as of November 30th, the delinquency rate was 3.5. Delinquency rate at 3.5 was terrible. But look at the forecast, 8.1%, and it's gonna jump to 9.9%. And now multifamily actually is a little bit better, at most up, up to 1.5%. So multifamily is fine. But the reason why I want to bring this up is, yes, it has an impact on the economy, but also a lot of the local or the regional banks are the ones that actually um, loan out these monies to uh, CRE uh, mortgages. And if we have any default, their money will be tied up. They're not going to be able to use those money for residential. So just keep that in mind. Of course. We have an election year. 
that is always something to uh, you know, take note of. But I will tell you this, despite the fact that we have an election year, based on our uh, historical numbers, going back to uh, 1990, normally an election year versus an election year, there's not a whole lot of difference, typically. There is, a, there is some, but not a whole lot. Let me show you the, the difference. The dark blue bars, those are all years, including election years. The light blue bars, those are election years only. So this shows you the sales growth per, for, by, for each fund. It looks like it outpaces every, every other year. Yes, but don't, don't, don't look at the, um, like the magnitude, look at the direction. Direction meaning in the first seven months, yeah. we're seeing growth in sales in every single month, right. whether it's election or not. But look at the last uh, four months of the year. In an election year, we tend to have an increase in sales in the last four months versus in a overall year, it's a decline. Uh, I don't know the exact reason. It could be because people uh, have already kind of figured out and maybe things kind of settle down a little bit. Breath up until November. And then they focus <laughs> on, they just get. right, and then they start focusing on, you know, uh, buying. So sales growth, if it follows a similar pattern, which means we might actually have some similar sales growth. Good fourth the, quarter. Yes, good fourth quarter, maybe the end of third quarter or so. So historically, in election year, fourth quarter is good. Better than, a, better than a better than a uh, normal, right? Same for price. Even though we have we are seeing you know increase in price growth every uh, whether it be um, a normal year or election year, they they tend to trend similarly, except maybe starting at the end of that, at the end of the year, you start seeing election uh, sale of price growth actually outpaced normal. It may have to do with the demand a little bit higher too. Just so that's just uh, this, the numbers I showed you earlier. So if it follows a similar pattern, we actually might have a decent fourth quarter uh, towards the end of the year. The second quarter looks pretty good too. Yeah. Um, so just to summarize, these are the bullet points that I just mentioned. Inflation, they're probably going to come down. Um, it may not come down as fast as what we originally believed. But it's still going to be above that pre-pandemic level, the two and a half percent. It's going to take a little bit more time. Uh, I was I would say the worst for rates probably is over. Meaning, last year we had eight percent, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be done. But I can't tell you that we're going to get back to six right away. Um, my speculation is we probably will by the end of this, by the mid of this year, we probably will hit average six and a half. For 30 year, by the end of this year, about 6% or so average. And then next year, we probably will be somewhere around four, uh, 575, 550. Uh, and then home sales will bounce back, like I showed you, probably up 20%. But the lack of inventory is going to still be a, a problem. But that also is going to put upward pressure on prices. And that's why we're seeing about a 6% increase at the state level. And of course, these are the rising, these are the uh, wild cards or the market risk, insurance, rising insurance costs, political uncertainty, geopolitical tension, and of course, the CRA sector. Um, that I think wraps everything up. I have three slides that I want to show you. We do have a free seminar or webinar coming up if you want, if you're interested in looking at different perspectives, challenges, future direction. Um, you can scan this. Uh, QR code or go to CCRU.us upcoming events. Sorry. Um, three free classes from offered by CR. Um, check it out. Uh, I'm not exactly sure they, what they are, to be honest, um, <laughs> but check it out. Uh, and of course, we do have one pager of fire insurance, um, sort of cheat sheet. You can download these and share with your clients. It talks about you know um, what you need to do. Um, what are some of the facts about fire insurance? Take a look. Um, it's on uh, on.cr.org insurance. So check it out. Car is by far uh, the 
best value for your money when it comes to associations, right? Thank you. Yes, There's a lot in there, like things like this. You, you know, be great in your, you know, your door knocking library, right? Absolutely. Um, my one question for you that I think is on everybody's mind, if it's not, it should be, is what's the opportunity this year, right? In every market, right? It's it's. Yes, there's there's those uh, you know there's things that are not going to work and there but there all there are there's always opportunity. Yes. Now, if you look at it from the standpoint of okay, let's look at the macro uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Macro perspective. Last year, we, we thought at the end of last year or middle of last year, we thought okay, well, the market is going to actually the, not the market, the economy is going to slow down significantly. Yeah. That's going to affect consumers. But the fact is, this year we know that things are actually looking a little bit better. Now, looking a little bit better means interest rates are probably going to go down the, and the consumers or buyers are probably having a little bit more confidence compared to last year because they know the economy and the market are doing well and they actually have been holding back, holding back. I think part of the reason or part of the opportunity is buyers starting to realize that, okay, well, the norm is five, so five and a half, to that high, five and a half, six percent. Yeah. And also, you could see a little bit more demand because, like I said earlier, you can only hold off on life-changing events so much. So you could see a little bit more demand. The question is, where are we going to see the supply? Um, now, you already got a glimpse last year. New home sales actually went, new, newly constructed buildings actually went up quite a bit at the end of last year. Um, possibility of, you know, hooking up with, maybe developers, maybe helping out, you know, on, because developers, I think builders, a lot of consumers decide to go to developers partly because they do buy downs. That might be one of the reasons why, you know, they can actually lock in at a real, real, real uh, rate. But I do believe any, any, everyone in this room, you guys are the expert, you know the market, you know what's going on with, um, you know, rates, so I think buyers and sellers are probably now a little bit more convinced that, okay, well, we're not going to go back to the three or 4%. Where are we going? How can you help me to actually get, get yeah. the best deal? So that's my take. Okay, excellent. Uh, you know, no, you know, I mean, no uh, REOs or uh, short sale, not, none of that's really come into play yet. REO short sales are probably not. So, those are distress sales. Yeah. Typically, we need to have it go down by a pretty significant right. amount. We don't think that is going to happen. It's going to inch up from last year. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the inching up is not going to offer a lot of distress sales. I still, feel, I still think you know um, the best bet is probably try to see that if, if buyers and, and buyers specific, specifically, not sellers, if buyers, they want not to... Uh, they want to get the best uh, affordable housing, for example. No, I should say affordable housing. The, the uh, 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 property that's most affordable to them, then one way to do it is, you know, like I said, hook up with developers. Um, it's still going to be, there will still be challenges. Let me put it this way, this year. It's not going to be as, uh, as bad as last year. Things are actually looking up a, a bit better because we know, confirmed by you know, the um, Federal Reserve, that rates are coming down. So we just need to convince, you know, buyers that yeah. there are a lot of properties out there. Sure. And of course, the seller side, I think they probably know as well. Yeah. And, and it really goes to the, you know, this is a skills-based market, right? You have to be able to create confidence with your clients by having those skill-based conversations with right. them about, you know, this is where we are today and where we're going to be for a while. And um, this is what your buying power looks like today, your selling power looks like today. Right. And of course, um, there are, for first-time buyers, for example, they probably need a little bit more help in terms of getting maybe some additional money from yeah. the government. Yeah. So finding out those programs, trying to figure out what's the best you know you can do for them in terms of getting them of course um you don't want to put them in a situation where they're financially um uh, in a financial situation where they're not able to you know afford a house but uh there are a lot of ways a lot of things uh, that i think you can teach your buyers and sellers Excellent.
Thank you, Oscar. Any Thank uh, you. other uh, questions that anybody would like to ask? Or is it the screen's real? Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of numbers, Oscar. We just have to manage. No. Well, that's why you know, the slides are that's out there. Uh, try to digest it you know, when you have a chance. Thank you and so then, much, Oscar. Oh, this is my, of course, my perfect email Thank address. You. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to do a question. Yes. Did you say you had something on the rental market? Well, yes. So yeah. shoot me an email. Okay. I can send you the rental housing market uh, outlook. It's a 2025 slide deck, so I can send it to you. And if you're interested, I know I didn't talk about it. If you're interested in global or uh, international global real estate, I did a presentation That's last so, week wow. for global real estate. That's awesome. Awesome. I just uh, I just have some resources. <laughs> hey, Samantha, could you reach out for both of those so we have them? So could you reach out for the global and the lease with Oscar so we have them and we can sure. I'll send them. I'll send them both. I'll send yeah, I'll send them to Samantha. Perfect. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. We know those numbers by heart. Thank you for having me. Sure. Thank you. I mean, sometimes I use the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I told you. Yeah, this is very good. Hi. I'm sorry. I'm coming out. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other? Are there any other? Are there any other? Are there any other? Are there any other?